Hello, friends. Happy afternoon. Happy Wednesday. Welcome. Cellar Chats, weekly wine flights here at Second Glass. We're, we're, we're traveling to Italy because I just can't get enough of it. And, you know, who, who doesn't want to love a little more Italian wine? And we're also, I realized this morning when I was, or this morning, earlier today when I was getting ready to come in and do this, that we are on the third Sartorelli featured wine in probably two months, which is super fun. And they've all been different, which is not something we usually do, but I kind of like it. It's, it's an extra fun vibe. So I, I you know, so eloquently uh, described this week's wine flight as the Adriatic to the Alps, because that's pretty much what we're doing. We're going to work our way from the Adriatic in La Marque, and then we're going to bounce on up to Alto Adige at the, the base of the Alps there, right before you get into Austria. Basically, we're, you know, stone throw away from the Austrian border. And then we're going to head on off to the Veneto to visit our lovely friends at Pra. So this week, Sartorelli, Verdicchio, their Classico, which is I mean, truly one of the great values of Italian wine, or just white wine in general. Um, so, so good. Such a good price point. Uh, and then we're going to do a little Elena Volk, uh, their Rosato 2026. Um, not the vintage 2026. The wine is called 2026. 20, I'll get into that in a bit. And then we're going to round it out with Pra, Valpolicella, their Morandina. Tasty, tasty stuff. So let's get into it. Um, Sarge Valley, I won't go, I won't go too much into these guys just because we've had the, you know, we've had a wine on here from them, you know, like I said, three times, now three times in the last probably two months, but really lovely family focused exclusively on Verdicchio. Uh, they just celebrated their 50th anniversary of the winery, um, which is really amazing. Um, and it is now slowly in the transition of being passed down to the next generation, although the the patriarch of the family is still very involved, but his daughter, Katarina, has taken on a more um, substantial role at the winery and for the business, which is really exciting to see for such a really, really cool and interesting wine. So again, we're talking Verdicchio. Ooh, lovely. Which is also known as Trebbiano... Um, De Suave, up in Suave in the Veneto. Um, Verdicchio is one of those great varieties that, along with, let's see, I'm gonna see if I can name them all. You've got Verdicchio in La Marque, you've got Fiano in Campania, you have um, Friulano up in Friuli, you have Cataracto in Sicily, and I feel like there's one more, probably something like uh, Timoroso. Um, those are like the five grape varieties, at least in my opinion, of white grape varieties of Italy that really deserve to be given more attention for their ability to make very complex, um, age-worthy, but also just incredibly delicious wines. Um, and they're just not talked about enough. So anytime I can talk about one of those more than once in two months is a good time for me. Um, so this is their basic level. Just their Verdicchio de Castelli di Eze, uh Classico. So just clean, fresh, a lot of like citrusy sea spray vibes. I mean, if you if you look at La Marque, it basically sits due, due east of Tuscany, where Chianti Classico is on the Adriatic side, hence the name Adriatic to the Alps. Um, sits along the Adriatic coast, and this is kind of like, at least in my opinion, the border of Le Marche and Abruzzo is kind of the cutoff between southern Italy and as you're moving into northern Italy. Um, to the north, you've got Emilia Romagna, and then you move into Veneto and Alto Adige, and then you're basically way up in the Alps. So, <clears throat> yeah, delicious, fresh, clean, lemon, citrus vibrancy. A little like there is, and I mentioned it previously when we did the Trilivio a couple weeks ago with Verdicchio, there's all this, always this kind of subtle, like green slash bitter almond character that it's not quite marzipan like, but it kind of reminds me of like, if you're having like maybe uh, an almond pastry 
or an almond croissant and you get the slivers of almonds on the top that are that are usually raw or slightly toasted and they have that really like you know great almond flavor but they're not super sweet they're almost like bitter that's what that reminds me of in the best way possible mm. i mean if this is not the answer to spicing up the boringness of the plethora of Pinot Grigio that is out on the market. Um, just caveat, I love Pinot Grigio. There's great ones. I sell a lot of them. I like to drink them, but let's all be honest, the majority of them are not fun to drink. They're just boring. This wine does all the same things, bright, fresh, easygoing, but it's just so much more interesting and offers the same thing I think people look for in Pinot Grigio. It's fruity, it's crisp, it's fresh, serve it super chilled, it's great for summertime. Um, but, you know, this is from a small family winery based in Lamarque and, and not a massive conglomerate based who knows where. So anyways, uh, off my soapbox there. Again, that is Sartorelli, their Classico Verdicchio di Castelli di Yezzi. All right, bouncing over or bouncing up to Elena Volk, the lovely, lovely ladies of Elena Volk, which, yes, her name is Elena. And it is pronounced Volk, like a V. Um... The family is historically Austrian, so, you know, German-speaking, as is a lot of the Alto Adige region. Um, Elena married into the family. She took over, no, it did take over, but she asked to be given the opportunity to focus all of their state-owned vineyards into her own winery that was focused on quality, not quantity. Um, cause at the time the label that's called Wilhelm Volk, uh, which was the parent company, which was the company that existed still does to this day, um, was really like so many wineries of the time focused on making lots of quantity of wine. Um, you have to remember that this is not long after World War II and most of Italy was dirt, dirt poor. So they were just trying to make ends meet. So can't really fault them for that. And they still make great wines at Wilhelm Volk. But Elena wanted to focus on a state grown and focus on sustainability and showcasing how beautiful the Alto Adige region is, which if, you, if you've never looked at pictures or if you haven't been, check it out. Steep hillsides, beautiful mountainous. I mean, it looks and feels more Germanic than it does Italian, but regardless of the language they speak and what the signs say, it is part of Italy. So this is mostly Pinot Nero, which has a long history in this region, along with a little bit of Merlot and Lagrine, which is a, a indigenous grape variety to the Alta Adige that I personally love. I think they make, um, Lagrine can be vibrant and fresh. It's almost like a Malbec meets Cabernet Franc in a way. Um, but anyways, onto this Rosato. Um, I think, I think in the, in the tasting notes for this wine, I, I put something like move over Provence, here comes Alto Adige, which is not wrong. I mean, look at the color of this. Absolutely gorgeous, you know, onion skin, delicate salmon color. The nose is bright, clean, and fresh. I mean, this is the epitome of what people look for in great summertime rosé for sipping by the pool or sitting outside with a group of friends you know, what have you. This is all the things that they want. It just doesn't say Provence, France. Here it says Alto Adige, Italy. Actually, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. It is Vignetti delle Domomiti. Um, and that is because they do have some vineyards that fall outside of, no, rewind. You can't use the Alto Adige DOC for rosé. There is no rosé category for Alto Adige, which is why they have to declassify it and use the more broad term. But this does all come from a state grown fruit. Um, 2026, which is the name of the wine, not the vintage, in case you thought we were going in time and coming back with this wine, um, refers to the degrees of bricks. I think it's degrees of bricks, but basically the, the sugar content level at which the fruit is harvested and then the temperature at which it is fermented. So it is harvested at 20 degrees. It, it's not bricks, it's another Italian term, so it's not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio to bricks, which just means sugar accumulation. Um, getting a little technical there. And then 26 degrees uh, Celsius, which is where they is the fermentation, so. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So good. Wow. Super bright, tart cherry, kind of strawberry and cream. Not really strawberries and cream, but definitely like tart, lush strawberries. Like, I just walked out into Lewis Farms, like, pick your own, like, you know, basically strawberry field there off of Gordon Road. It's hot. It's sunny. I pulled the ripest strawberry off of the, the bush there, and I just took a bite out of it right in the middle of the field. It's hot. It's sweaty. I'm picking strawberries, but I need something refreshing, and that's what I get, and boom, that's it. In a glass. <coughs> Done. Moving on. Again, Elena Volk Rosato 2026 from the 2022 vintage. Very confusing. Lots of twos and zeros. All right, last but not least, our lovely friends over at Pra in the Veneto. You know, probably most notably, not probably, they are most notably known for their Suave, really incredible bottlings of Suave from Classico all the way up to single vineyard and single appellate, like single region. Yeah, single vineyard, sing, single hillside bottlings. Um, of Suave, they make most, almost all of their Suave bottlings are from 100% Garganiga, um, which is kind of the, the flagship grape, but then they do make one wine where they use some of that Treviano de Suave, which I mentioned, same grape as Verdicchio. But this is their <clears throat> Valpolicella project, which they started maybe 20, 20, 25 years ago, give or take. My math, my math, my memory may not be super accurate, but it's not far off so much newer to the family you know they've been in there in the region for since like the early 80s late 70s um and i think they started the valpola cello project maybe 15 20 years ago uh, morandina refers to the name of the vineyard where it is located so they purchased one site um a cooler climate volcanic with some limestone base soil um, which is really unique for this area and they produce these really lifted, lively versions of um, Valpolicella. So they make a uh, Ripasso, which, oddly enough, Celeste also has here on the list. And it's just there to bottle sitting in front of me, so I thought I would show that. I think we might have done that on one of our calls as well. They make this classic Val Valpolicella, kind of classico, like just basic version. And then obviously they make an Amarone. All of them come from the same vineyard site, and all of them have this like underlying freshness and a little bit of like arugula, peppery, almost like volcanic soil characteristic to them. Um, I find these wines just plain delicious, really fresh. To me, this is a great summertime red, pizza wine, burger wine, you know, what have you. Tomahawk, you know, pork chop, you know, whatever your vibe is. Again, you get some of that really pretty like green herbaceousness on the nose some volcanic characteristics, dark kind of black and blue berries. I mean, you can see it is not a deeply colored wine. They're all made from somewhat equal parts. Um, classic blend of Valpolicella, which is Corvina, Corvignone, Rondinella and Osaleta, which um, is kind of the oddball. I mean, it's always traditionally been used in the Valpolicella region, but only recently has kind of come back into vogue. It was often thought to of, you know, for whatever reason, producers didn't think that it had great characteristics. So it wasn't always in um, use, but in the last like five to 10 years, it seems to have had a bit of a resurgence. Um, the guys at Pra, Graziana Pra and his family have, you know, always had Osaleta in their blend as far as I know. On the palate, kind of crunchy pomegranate, cranberry, like raspberry fruit. Wow, that wine is super fun. Yes, and for those of you who are asking, yeah, the, the prow is chilled. And it's really lovely with the chill because it's got great acidity and good freshness. All right, quickly, the wrap up for this week's weekly wine flights here at Second Glass, which start tonight because it's Wednesday. So stop watching this video. Come in here and have some flights and have some delicious bites. Sartrelli Classico Verdicchio starting out the, the flights this week. Then you bounce into the lovely Elena Volk Rosato 2026 Cuvée. And then rounding it out, Pra Valpolicella Morandina. 
such tasty wines, but we all know I'm biased because they're Italian, so I'm clearly going to love them. Um, that all said, be safe. Tell, tell your loved ones you love them and that they're amazing. Say hi to your friends. Be good. Support small business.